Hey team, I'm frequently asked for advice that I have for high school students who are looking to go into medicine. My name is Danny. I'm a medical student in Canada and I was admitted to medical school with just one application at the age of 20. Looking back to high school, I see how much I've learned on my journey that would have been super helpful back then. That's what I'm hoping to provide you with today. Make sure to stick to the end and I'll be leaving my best advice for last. My first piece of advice is broad and it's going to apply to your entire life but do hear me out, I'm going to explain how it's relevant to you getting into medical school. During high school, you might be thinking that everything you need to be doing should be related to getting admitted to a medical school and that everything else is kind of secondary. I believe that this isn't necessarily the right approach. Instead, keep your interests broad at first. See what other areas have to offer you and follow many passions. Find your path of maximum fulfillment because if you're doing something that you enjoy doing, it's more than likely that you'll be happier and more successful at doing it. Throughout my undergrad, I realized that entrepreneurship and business were things that I was interested in and that I found fulfillment in pursuing. I tried to start a business around a machine learning algorithm that I developed for identifying parasites in blood samples. Unfortunately, it didn't turn into anything, but I learned a lot of lessons along the way that I've brought with me into medicine. I also participated in a healthcare business case competition with a few friends. And we ended up taking second place out of 20 teams mainly comprised of business students. Coming from a science degree, this allowed me to demonstrate that I have varied interests and strengths. Now this is where I relate it back to medicine. In Canada, you can study anything with your undergraduate degree and still apply to medicine. The large majority of applicants do programs in the life sciences, which is great if you enjoy that, but a good number definitely don't and it really does show in their work ethic. The same principle applies to other aspects of your application. Do the extracurriculars that you enjoy and find meaning in. Otherwise, you'll probably have difficulty writing an application that conveys genuine passion and personal growth. On top of all that, medical school application committees tend to choose applicants that have diverse lived experience to bring to the incoming class. This means learning, growing, and doing things that reflect your unique perspective on life. Secondly, I wanted to dispel a common myth among high school students about the prestige of university programs. I understand the desire to feel important by going off to a prestigious program at a prestigious university. You might think that this gets you ahead in life, but for medicine, it doesn't matter. Let me explain. Medical schools do not give priority to applicants based on which university they attended or the program that they were in. Medical schools simply care about your academic performance measured by your grade point average. For example, a student at the University of Toronto studying engineering that gets a 3.7 is seen as worse than a student studying science at Queen's who gets a 3.9. So make your decision about where you want to go for university based on where you think you're most likely to succeed in terms of both your grades as well as extracurriculars, not the place that you can brag about the most. Number three is to like and subscribe to the channel. No, seriously, you should. The videos on my channel can give you a better idea of what a career in medicine entails and give you the informational advantage that you need to get a leg up in the admissions process. Next, I wanna talk about making friends in university. If you're watching this video, I'm assuming you're a high school student and when you go off to university, most people tend to make new friend groups. I cannot emphasize how important it is to really do this right. You may have heard the saying that you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. While I don't think that's 100% true, I do think that these five people do have an unduly influence on who you are as a person and how you develop, which makes it important that you choose your friends wisely. Numerous studies have shown how much the people that you surround yourself with influence your habits. This ranges from areas like fitness to studying and even smoking. If your friends are all spending Friday night studying for an upcoming exam, odds are you will be too. That doesn't mean that all your friends should be going towards a career in medicine, but having friends who are all going along the same life trajectory as you can help you become more successful by developing good habits, sparking collaborations with one another, and sharing strategies. It's also great to have friends who are not pursuing medicine, who can help you create a balance between your quest to become a physician and everything else that life has to offer. We also shouldn't forget that podcasts, books, or any other form of media that you're consuming can have a significant impact on who you are as a person. By being intentional over who you spend your time with and selective over the content that you consume, 
you can better guide your personal development. To end this piece of advice off, I want to share some podcasts that I have been listening to during 2020. One of my favorites is The Knowledge Project, which is an interview-based podcast with notable guests like the Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman. The Knowledge Project aims to improve the way listeners think by capturing the expertise of many knowledgeable guests. The Gary Vee audio experience is another great one if you're interested in content creation and overall positive vibes. The last one is Naval, which has changed the way that I think about money and happiness for the better. Here is my last piece of advice. Many people are too afraid to pick up a phone and call a friend unannounced, let alone send an email to someone that they don't know. If you can master the art of cold emailing, you can get pretty much anything that you want. The key with cold emailing is to find ways to provide the other person with value. This could be offering them a good or service for free. For example, offering to work for free for someone who could provide mentorship in exchange. It could also be by giving them a feeling of importance. I started a small podcast and I was able to get some amazing guests on the show. All I needed to do was send an email to the guest explaining how their expertise would go appreciated by my listeners. Instilling a feeling of importance to your recipient can also come from your own inexperience. I'll explain. Young people have a pass on asking career-related questions to anyone who's further along in their career trajectory compared to them. And it's not just because these people are able to empathize with your cause. By asking them a question, you're recognizing that what they have accomplished is admirable, which gives them a sense of self-importance, which feels really good. As you can see, there are ways to get your recipient to open and respond to your email by simply providing value at no significant cost to yourself. Cold emails are also super applicable to careers in medicine. Not only can they help you find mentors, but they can also help you land critical experiences like jobs, volunteer opportunities, and research positions. All of these things can help strengthen your application to medicine along the way, giving you a significant advantage. If you're looking for something to watch next, I made a video on how I landed five research positions using cold emailing techniques. I'll put the video in the cards, which should appear up here, as well as the description. As always, leave a comment if you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer them. And thanks for watching.